Welcome everybody. Good morning for those of you who are in the US. Good evening for those of you who are already in Central Asia. I know it's late there and good afternoon for those who are in the middle somewhere in Europe. Welcome to this seminar of the Central Asia program at GW, uh, launching the book, the latest book of uh, Diana Khudaibirgenova toward nationalizing regimes, conceptualizing power and identity in the post-Soviet realm. I'm particularly pleased to have this event today because I remember reading what was at the beginning a PhD by Diana and seeing all the different steps of the transformation from the PhD to this final uh, uh, book. And I must say, it's a great book. It will be a seminal work on, on the way we try to articulate the relationship between the nature of political regimes in uh, globally in the post-Soviet space and the ideological choices done by each regime related to nation building. And that has been a key issue for scholarship, I think, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but we were really missing someone looking in depth at exactly that articulation and also looking, which I think is quite fascinating, at two very different regions or regions we imagine as different, one being the Baltic state, the other being Central Asia with the example of Latvia and Kazakhstan. And I remember, because I'm old enough, that in the 90s, comparing that to region were key in the studies of, of, of the post-Soviet transformation and then he kind of got forgotten but I think Diana really showed in the book how much it's interesting to make that kind of comparison. So Diana, once again, congratulations for the book being uh, out and, and, and welcome to this seminar. I will first give the floor uh, to Diana for a very short presentation uh, uh, of the book. And I have to say also that we should congratulate uh, uh, Diana for not only the book, but also for being now officially a lecturer at the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge, her alma mater. And then I will give the floor to our two discussants and I will thank them very much for being here with us today. The first we will have uh, Asel Dolod Keldieva, who is senior lecturer at the OSC Academy in Bishkek. And then we will have Maria Rojava, who is a researcher at the University of Oslo. Then I will give the floor back to Diana for a few comments on the, the, the discussions, uh, a comment, and then we will open the floor for q and I invite you to ask questions and make comments in the chat box, and then I will mod be moderating the discussion for the last half hour of our seminar. Once again, welcome, and Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marlene, and thank you, the Central Asia Program at GW. Thank you for both of the discussions. I hope it's going to be an excellent discussion today. Thank you, Maria and Asel. And uh, in general, I should thank Marlene for being such a great mentor, not only to me, but to the whole community of Central Asians in this field and uh, for many more other people and for bridges that you're building and for the opportunities you're giving us. So thank you so much. And that's actually uh, in terms of you being in my career for since the beginning of this whole project, as you said, it was my dissertation. I'm just going to speak really, really briefly for a couple of minutes just to describe my main argument. I'm a political sociologist. I was looking into nationalism uh, specifically from the perspective of power relations. I was really interested in encapsulating uh, what are the different power, um, you know, dynamics, who decides what's going to, what the nation is going to look like. Um, and um, I did sort of, as you can see from the title of the book, it's about regime, not the state so much. I'm very interested in identifying regime as a power field. That's where the competition, that's where the struggle for power, specifically political power and decision making happens. And in the book, basically, my main argument is that it's not the state that decides um, how, how this particular state will nationalize, but it's actually the um, decision making and the meaning production is all within the political regime. And that's why we need to look into the regime and the elites uh, in order to identify these different struggles and also in order to identify the fact that nation building itself is not something that is fixed. It's also a field. It's also constantly co con contested. It's a field of battleground, uh, of contestation of different ideas coming from the elites that are trying to control this field in order to struggle for more power and define their position. So I'm quite producing in that sense, but also it's contested from below as well by different groups. I, I slightly touch upon them, uh, like especially the grassroots movement groups that I'm um, currently working on, but also minorities and how these minorities are encapsulating themselves and how the regime tries to uh, portray them. I'm specifically talking about the Russians in both in Latvia and in Kazakhstan is also a struggle in this in this debate. So that's what, what the book is really all about. It does compare uh, Latvia and Kazakhstan, but it puts forward this more um, conceptual argument, again, building on Bourdieu, that uh, we need to look into the power field in order to understand why and how nation becomes what it is. 
So thank you. Um, I should stop here and I should pass the word on to Asel, I give you the floor. Um, okay, um, hello everyone. Um, Diana, it was such a pleasure to read your book and I'm really glad to be part of this book discussion right now. And I hope that we can generate um, a very nice conversation and think how your book can actually talk to other places um, across uh, post-Soviet uh, space. I would like to thank also uh, Marlene Daruel and the program for giving this, um, uh, this book and Diana and all of us, the Central Asian community, to have a chance to, to talk about, our, uh, about the new research. So um, um, when I finished reading uh, Diana's book, um, I was really impressed because it's an extremely ambitious project uh, that she endeavored. And why it is ambitious? Well, on several, uh, in several regards. First of all, because it's comparative. Uh, so comparing two countries, which are quite different. The second is, um, covering actually quite a lengthy um, decade, uh, three decades of history of independence um, in two countries. That's also quite a big challenge. And third is um, a mixed methodology that Diana used. Um, it's um, a lot of empirical data, ethnography, uh, but also archival work, elite interviews, uh, if I remember more than 200 interviews, that's really impressive. And I really, um, so I just uh, enjoyed so much uh, this uh, qualitative data uh, that Diana was able to bring on the table and very nicely combine this, um, you know, local voices with their, at the same time, their elite uh, insights and their memories and narratives of the past, uh, but also their archival detail and how all this uh, really kind of intertwine um, inter to um, produce a very rich um, um, narrative um, and that's really impressive and uh, I just really loved these stories uh, brought up by local people in Riga or in Almaty, uh, this beautiful woman uh, story of uh, Anna, this is really very enriching and I believe that ethnography and um, this um, uh, taking really uh, bothering to take this local stories is the best uh, method actually in order to um, complement uh, their, uh, the their discourse analysis and their uh, narratives of the elites because it gives this the other part of the story uh, how did the local populations how did the ethnic minorities felt under this, this different um, uh, ideological choices done by their uh, by the minority elites Right, so that uh, was um, really nice to, to read and uh, that really helped to understand what happened in Kazakhstan, in Latvia, uh, regarding the, the question of uh, ethnic minorities. So, and although um, the, the red line of the, of the book, uh, at least the way I understood it, uh, right, the way that I read it, uh, the red line of the book was about uh, constantly emphasizing the, the differences between the two nationalizing regimes between uh, of Latvia and the Kazakhstan. But actually, I think that uh, this uh, emphasis on the difference uh, downplayed uh, the similarity of these cases, which is, I think, also really uh, important to stress. And this similarity um, um, is about basically the, the situation of, their, of the language, the situation of the ethnic minorities, which is really crucial for those who have traveled to Baltics or Kazakhstan, we would immediately understand actually what Diana is talking about and why this is such a critical issue. I was myself in Kazakhstan two years ago, just in summer 2019, uh, after the uh, election of the new second president, as Diana puts it in her book. Uh, and I just was really shocked how, uh, uh, Slavic um, representatives of Slavic minority groups were really panicking about what's going to be happening on the, uh, in terms of interethnic relations, including the experts, which just means how much actually this national ideology traveled very far to convince the uh, people on the ground about this stability and power formula, right? So I think that uh, makes it a perfect case for comparison. I think we should compare, and Diana's book 
just actually show that we should really compare the Baltics and Central Asia. I think uh, uh, it just provides a very fruitful discussion. So I'm going to continue with that. Um, so I very much liked Diana how we juxtaposed the democratic but ethnically exclusive uh, Latvian case and um, more of an authoritarian but ethnically ambiguous um, and a little bit more um, inclusive uh, Kazakh case. And you show how this national ideology is um, have been intrinsic to the elite competition, elite composition, right? And at the same time, you show that, um, you demonstrate that these were not really uh, totally instrumental. They were also kind of linked to and um, linked to the um, historical ideas formed already in case of Latvia, formed uh, pre pre previously before the uh, Soviet occupation. And in case of Kazakhstan, these ideas about uh, their uh, nation building were formed um, as certain mindset, mentalité during the Soviet Union and how these ideas then were shaping the, um, the choices of the elite. But I have a question. So um, to, basically, I, I don't know um, how to really formulate it accurately. I, I, I hope you can, um, you, can, you can understand me. So um, I was wondering uh, to which extent um, this actually elite competition are comparable in Latvia and Kazakhstan because um, in your book you really um, demonstrate how this elite competition was really taking place in Latvia. You, you show how this the, during the elections and the different political parties how were they were um, uh, competing among themselves and therefore contributing to this um, maintenance of the hegemonic reading of the nation in, in Latvia. But then you come to Kazakhstan where basically you yourself you say that it's a, a personalistic regime built around one person and therefore the elite competition is of course uh, much more reduced uh, compared to Latvia, right? So um, and um, also, you show basically towards the end more recent developments, how the uh, Nazarbayev regime became um, um, became challenged uh, from grassroots uh, mobilizations, uh, from different protest movements and different nationalistic groups. But we don't see uh, that kind of discussion, um, for example, uh, around mid. 2000, uh, when there was uh, a democratic movement, right? But I don't know to which extent that democratic movement uh, is meaningful to elite competition around the national idea. So it would be nice to, to know a little bit more whether actually uh, Nazarbayev was challenged um, in earlier stages and whether this elite competition then can be really kind of captured in Kazakhstan. So um, I don't know, do you have still time, Madeleine? Is it like? Yeah, yeah just a few, very few minutes, yes. Yeah, just then the, the last uh, question. So this, follow, uh, this leads me to ask another question um, about then uh, the, um, the, the, the nature of this uh, um, nationalizing regimes. Uh, can we further uh, categorize, can we further distinct, distinguish among them? Because um, uh, in Kazakhstan, it looks like more as a, the regime as being patronal presidentialism, where uh, there is an elite competition, but to a lesser degree, and then uh, then basically the nationhood is then dictated and identified and formulated by uh, the president, right, by the patronal presidentialism. And uh, in Latvia, it's more of a party system, and therefore much more competitive um, uh, nation making, right? So. Um, um, and very final question, um, do you think um, your framework, your conceptualization of um, uh, nationalizing regimes can travel to other places? Can we use it for um, other countries of Central Asia and Caucasus? I believe yes. Uh, I just would, would uh, want to hear more from you, how you think it, it, this could be extended, right? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Asel. Uh, Maria. Hi everyone, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was an uh, incredible uh, journey to go through Diana's book and to our journey with her on uh, to Kazakhstan, to Latvia and through different decades. So I'm 
very grateful for her to share with me uh, her manuscript and uh, to learn from her um, from her book. Uh, I would like to start this kind of uh, uh, to highlight something that uh, I found uh, really interesting for myself and for my own research. Uh, I wanted to start by saying that much of the debate on the post-Soviet state has emphasized the importance of nation-state building agendas that uh, kind of was designed to facilitate this transition from the Soviet space to this national sovereign uh, um, nation state uh, that we find now Latvia and Kazakhstan. And in, your, in one of your concluding chapters, you also highlight this with a very wonderful note and kind of uh, resonated with me. You say, none of the post-Soviet political elites in Latvia and Kazakhstan question the necessity and form of nation building. And I'm kind of, uh, uh, I think that this book actually uh, helps to start a certain conversation, an important conversation that we need to have about the impact this nationalizing regime has on the political regime on the one side, but most, most importantly on political equality in uh, on political equality and political membership in democratic societies. Uh, I was asked to comment on uh, the case of Latvia more than Kazakhstan, so I'll focus my, my comments on the Latvian case, but at the same time, I wanted to highlight that the book really shines in comparison. This kind of comparative analysis of Kazakhstan and Latvia brings it brings a completely uh, different uh, dimension to this comparison because Latvia and Kazakhstan do often appear in comparison, but often come up appear in comparison of their respective regions, Central Asia or the Baltic states. But this comparison between Latvia and Kazakhstan helps to identify these gaps, uh, to, to identify gaps and find analytical bridges that help to build the connection between kind of nationalism studies and nation building in particular, but at the same time to bring uh, comparative regime studies and what we have seen and observed nowadays was uh, with coalition building studies and political elites. So this is for me connected a lot of dots on different conversation and different fields to which, to which I couldn't find and connect myself. So this book really helps to create certain lines and identify all those analytical bridges that you can have in uh, bringing those two cases. Um, but uh, I'll start with uh, Latvia. So uh, I would like to just to have two main takeaways, it will not be long, because uh, you identify Latvia uh, in, uh, in your book as ethnic electoral democracy, which provided you know, political rights only to citizens and to be citizen in Latvia uh, required, uh, to, um, required this kind of citizenship that uh, either uh, you are born into this citizenship or you're not naturalized. So it, it created this uh, two regime of citizens and non-citizens. Uh, and uh, most citizens did not gain citizenship after the 1994, 1994 citizenship law and were restricted uh, from applying uh, for naturalization due to the quotas, uh, quota system. Uh, while we managed to see some progress as well in a significant number of permanent residents remain without citizenship today and still are defined as non-citizen in, in Latvia. Uh, so, uh, in, in your book, you, you kind of highlight that in 2011, according to the national census, this number was still uh, around 280,000. So around 14% uh, of people were defined as non-citizen. And uh, I, lo I looked at the recent number in 2020, this number is still significant. It's uh, around 28,000 people. So around 11% are still uh, of the population still remain as non-citizen in Latvia. Uh, while some Russian-speaking community have managed to naturalize and gain this uh, citizenship, they still remained kind of disqualified from political participation or their political participation remained very limited. Uh, so the important aspect why and what led to this kind of situation, what we have observed in Latvia was a result of this building of the political coalition and this kind of comparison between Latvia and Kazakhstan, Latvia, democracy in one case, Kazakhstan as authoritarian regime helped, helped to, uh, to highlight that both uh, coalition building can contribute to, this, uh, to the type of nationalizing regime in both in democracies and authoritarian regimes. What happened in uh, Latvia is that it created this the ethnicide field of political participation where people who are non-members were not able to participate. 
So what kind of connected uh, with me in the book is the fact uh, that whenever I would have a question that uh, this one chapter would uh, bring up in, in my understanding, the next chapter will answer. And one of this kind of answers I found was about categorization. So Latvia is categorized as democracy and we, uh, and this mainly because many organizations recognize it as democracies. And in one of your kind of last chapters, I found very kind of fascinating about the role of uh, international actors such as OSCE and European Union that contributed to this categorization, right? Uh, so uh, we have European actors that have been supporting of state institutional design that was based on the majority or the interest of majority and played uh, uh, in a certain kind of uh, support of uh, creating the ethnically Latvian ideological coalition. So it not only contributed institutionally, but it also helped to build this informal coalition that we have observed in Latvia. And, uh, and I think this is kind of fascinating question that I would like to ask you about whether this institutional choices that we that uh, for Latvian de democracy has made at the beginning of uh, this nation building period has, has kind of shaped the entire period and policy decision later, whether there is a certain kind of past dependencies and nationalization regime bring on our kind of young democracy in general. Uh, so, uh, and whether this kind of uh, our conception of democracies that we had uh, back in the 90s, this kind of minimal conception of democracies have persisted in this application of categorization of Latvian democracy as well. And whether Latvia right now can be considered, you know, our, yes, it fulfills a certain norms of democracy, such as minimal conception of democracy, but is it a really a democracy without political equality? If we cannot guarantee this political equality, whether this, um, uh, this, if, there, if there is no principle of political equality, is not adhered in, uh, in society, whether it is democracy and, uh, and how it actually, we have to change this categorization or, or rethink those categorization. Um, and the second takeaway kind of comes uh, from um, very, diff very many interviews that are present in the book. And I think they are really a highlight in the book. Many authors often kind of refuse to include long uh, interview uh, extracts, but I find they are incredibly fascinating because uh, those conversational elements uh, indicate something more or add something uh, really interesting to the entire case because uh, one that kind of resonated with me was this conversation with a woman when you asked what it means for her to have a uh, red Latvian passport and it kind of uh, and there are many kind of conversation like this included, but one she said um, she responded that uh, she felt depressed and there were also kind of other words that were included like scared, afraid. So were those like informal elements that uh, indicated that there are certain kind of formal and informal elements of uh, how this uh, nationalization regime, um, what this nationalization regime uh, creates. Uh, so this um, kind of my last uh, takeaway or kind of open questions that I would like to ask you as well. Um, that while the concept of citizenship indicates or points to a formal belonging and formal inclusion in society, it also highlights how the chosen nationalization regime created many informal ways of being excluded. And it's kind of very visible in the case of Latvian society, right? But I was wondering when you compare both cases, uh, Estonia, uh, Latvia and Kazakhstan, whether Kazakhstan had more possibilities for informal inclusion and informal belonging rather than Latvian case. It created uh, quite a lot of ethnicized public and political spaces where, you know, it was not possible to be included in any way. So that was my, uh, my brief comment, but I'm very, very grateful. It's a wonderful book. Thank you so much, Maria. Diana, I wanted to give you the floor back a few minutes if you want to comment on the, some of the key points that both Assel and Maria mentioned, and then we will open the floor for the, the broader discussion. Yeah, and thank you so much. I, 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 as I said, I had a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for such a close reading and 
comments exactly on what I was thinking and debating when I was writing the, this manuscript. I think, yes, the um, how and why, coming back to Hassan's question, how and why competition and uh, elite competition is comparable in the two cases. And also this sort of resonates with uh, what, what, what Maria was also saying, that for me, of course, in terms of the understanding of democracy, and I think I'm, I'm a bit convention, I was a bit conventional here as a, as a student of political sociology in the beginning, is that I really paid attention to this access to election. And um, what is happening, um, both Latvia and Kazakhstan, to many different, and, and that's why I stress difference, um, nature is that the polit political competition and even access to elections is largely circumvented. Uh, in one country, it's based on, and bo in both cases, it's all institutional and legal, you know, they have the legal citizenship law in Latvia that is continuous from the Latvian Republic, the pre-Soviet one, and that sort of legally is allowed and institutionalized as sort of, you know, only citizens who were um, either born into the citizenship and, and which is, uh, happens to be ethnicized as well only they can can run for the elections and which leaves a lot of russian or sort of non-latvian uh, elites outside this this purview for a very long time in the beginning of the 90s and so on that is that access and that lack of access to political competition is highly institutionalized and legal the same thing happens in kazakhstan right now i'm actually finishing the paper on um the aspect of deinstitutionalized grassroots movements because they uh they they see the same problem the law is there that you, you can have access to the elections you can run in the elections but only if you have a political party but then in order to construct i mean build the political party there's so much that you have to do and still you won't be guaranteed that this, this party will be registered so i think these are two different scenarios of how uh the circumvention to political competition is completely institutionalized and legalized but then uh, it doesn't change the nature of the fact that it's not really a democratic system in in the end but in very different ways you can describe it as non uh, non non-democratic and actually that's what for me that's going to be probably the next step is to encapsulate more what does this non-democracy mean and that's to the question of um to the comment of maria which i really really like is that we need to rethink democratization and democracy as such if it's so perplexed and focused on elections and then you have cases like that 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 you know by paper they look legally normal normal um and democratic but then in the in the reality this is what happens so for me this was absolutely fascinating and that's why you know i'm, I'm really careful with that language and I'm playing with it throughout the book, but that's what a lot of my readers actually comment on and, and surprises them. Um, to the question of ICL, if the if the nationalizing regimes can be categorized uh, further and distinguish, there will be distinguished, distinguishable features between them, absolutely. And um, that was the biggest debate for me, is to publish the book as it is with empirical stuff or make it more into theoretical modeling and then publish it, you know, just in general as a conceptual one. Uh, in the end, I just thought that the, the breadth of data still required, you know, um, to see the light of the day. So that's why I, I published the book as it is. But I do work on conceptual paper at the moment, which is actually thinking nationalizing states and then looking into the different categorizations we can look at. And I definitely think, and that would be my uh, my dream to do, you know, a study um, across different states in the, in the post-Soviet region, not just Central Asia, but actually looking into Russia, which is also a nationalized regime but the very distinct one and uh features there would be very um interesting also personalized but then and that's the discussion i need to have with marlene with her new book and so on of how this plays out in russia but for me it's quite fascinating there as well and i think yes please let's take nationalizing regime to 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 other places and spaces as well and, and see how it works elsewhere um so um yes and it can be extended and i think in, in different cases it can also be extended for example um Brew baker's model really paid attention to this distinction between core what i call titular ethnicity and then minorities but again that also needs a revisiting and that needs a lot of critical conceptualization of who is the minority how do minorities see themselves but also the titular ethnicity in my understanding is very fragmented even when we consider saying that one state is particularly ethnic homogeneous and so on and so forth. Actually, when you look at it, um, it's not. And, and there are very distinct versions of what that ethnicity means on the ground. And that's what I was very blessed to do um, in my pre-pandemic fieldwork. And I'm, I'd really love to, to take that at some point further on in cases like South um, um, Azerbaijan, for example, in cases like even in Central Asia, Uzbekistan and so on. The identity is constantly contextual and fragmented. And that's what as a sociologist, seeing how these things work out on the ground, I can see that we should not take it for granted and we should not take it within the frigid frameworks that sometimes are assumed in, in literature like that, especially in the earlier 1990s literature. And just finally, just to final, finish a bit on um, Maria's comment about, you know, the past dependency, absolutely. And I think that's what I wanted to show with, with Latvia is that 
Um, it was a democratic wave, even with the Popular Front and so on. But then what you see is that Popular Front loses the election in 1993. And then by that time, they already um, put in, in, in motion the citizenship law that basically leaves Russians um, or non-Latvians behind and they cannot run for the elections. And then up until 1998, they cannot even naturalize because it's all quota based on age. And uh, the age uh, favors those who are younger, so from 18 and so on. And older people who are the elites in their mid 40, in the mid 40s, in the 50s, they were actually lamenting that time and they were telling me uh, we lost a window of opportunity, but it was so hard to fight it in the 90s because that was when nationalizing regime in Latvia was consolidating and consolidating its discourse. That's something that did not happen in Kazakhstan for a specific reason, because it wasn't the strategy of the regime to consolidate its discourses. The strategy was slightly different. That's why I think this, um, I, I do believe there are a lot of similarities that I need to pay attention to, but I think for me, uh, modeling the distinctions and seeing how it plays out in different uh, contexts was really, really, really important. So I can take it further. But thank you so much for your comments. This was absolutely great. And yes, there is a lot of informal inclusion in Kazakhstan. And that's what uh, my friend here, Projekti, who, who was also with me during that journey of the dissertation, she, she kept on saying that. But it's, it's very important to highlight that, that Kazakhstan is a lot more inclusive of different ethnicities, different minorities. So absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for this great discussion. We have a lot of questions coming now in, in the chat box. Let me try to organize them in a way that helps uh, the discussion moving. There are several questions about the, <clears throat> the role of history in this nation building and the way ideological regimes are constructed. One question by Ali about what, how you look at Soviet period role in the construction of this identity and would you say it as having an imperial slash colonial uh, uh, terminology? So the big <laughs> question about how to interpret the Soviet regime as a colonial imp empire or not. And another question asking you also how, um, sorry, I, I lost it. Yes, how the, the, the kind of Soviet memory, especially in Latvia with the annexation uh, during the Second World War, how all these elements or the famine in the, in the 30s in, in Kazakhstan, how do you think all these elements kind of play or create already a path of the way the nation building will be framed in, in post-independence uh, period? So kind of looking back in, in taking a kind of long durée <laughs> perspective. Uh, yes, absolutely. Very good questions and, and quite um, comparable. Yes, there is a lot of discussion on the imperial and colonial part, uh, especially, I mean, Baltic states have created their own field of uh, Baltic post-colonialism that I'm quite excited and constantly, you know, engaging with those debates. And they do perceive the Soviet Union not only to be the annex annexating power, but also that it, it is colonial power and that it colonized them. Um, so that's... Um, quite intriguing and interesting. Actually, um, my colleague here, I said to Tom Lewis, she's also in the audience, we are thinking about, you know, uh, providing this sort of conceptualizing further the understanding of how Sovietness played out and, and, and categorizing these identities. Again, this brings me back, and I think it's important to be in dialogue with existing and very dominant theory, or not theory, but at least the model of how we view post-Soviet nationalisms. Um, and I'm more leaning toward Marlene and, and how you conceptualize these ideas, but Unfortunately, a lot of scholars, unfortunately, follow Rogers. So, um, and, and, and his, his understanding is very, like, you know, fixed, very um, straightforward that it's about codification, it's about classification, and Soviet legacy is super important. And we need to look at it as something, the way I read him is that he takes it for granted and um, he views it as a very dominant perspective and there is something set in stone. I'm actually um, here. Um, rethinking this whole idea because I actually can see that there is a generation of people who do not think the same way. They already, you know, people who were born in, in the po late post-Soviet, post-independent period, so late 1990s, 2000s, they don't have these frameworks and they think completely differently. And I think that's why it's so important to study the grassroots movements because you can see that's where the youth is coming from. And I don't want to call them youth, uh, you know, movements, they're just grassroots movements. But there you can see how even this distinction between Russian language and Kazakh language, which was a big uh, political framing in Kazakhstan, like, you know, you either Kazakh speaking or Russian speaking, that doesn't no longer works in these movements. They bilingual, they don't mind. They, they, and, and that's why I put in the introduction, I say, what's the difference between Kazakh with a Q and Kazakh with a K? That's precisely it. That's the shift from 
post post Soviet, if you want to put it like that. So actually, we need to challenge the whole understanding of Soviet codification and how uh, not only generationally but also contextually it should be critically um, be approached again. So I think that's definitely there. Um, about the famine and annexation, I think that's what's called sort of, it's usually banned with this uh, post-colonial trauma. I did write about it. Um, I do, I, I have a bunch of papers in the making right now, but I do have a paper that's been forever in the writing about how famine was actually forgotten in Kazakhstan and how certain groups tried to bring it back, but it only uh, was brought back quite recently, a few years back, and it was done by cultural elites, not national patri patriots who were really cautious talking about it, but actually by artists. So it's, it's quite interesting through the different practices and performances. And the regime was really reluctant to speak about these things before. Great. L let me continue on, on some of the elements that you mentioned. One of them was um, the, the fact that the ethnic nation itself is maybe also a challenging notion, in particular in Kazakhstan. And we have a question asking you also to comment on the, the kind of Kazakh segment of the mm -hmm. Kazakhstani nation building and how much it can be fragmented and also uncertain about what it means to be an ethnic Kazakh. And how would you compare that with the Latvian case where <clears throat> ethnicity for the titular majority is maybe much more obvious, but I, I let you commenting on that. And also adding the element of uh, uh, identification to languages and the language question into this, this uh, uh, big discussion, because here also the two contexts are quite different. So the, the kind of the ethnic segment of the nation building and the, the links with the language question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um... I think titular ethnicity in general is a very challenging notion and that, that um, and I, I was just writing about it today, is that it's not really, um, again, there's one thing of how it was perceived historically and then what happened. And I think there is this, this transformation in the post-Soviet that something happens and it changes. And largely it also changes because of the nationalized regime, because the way it started framing titular ethnicity in different uh, states, that it no longer was Soviet in content as such, right? So it lost its frames, but it, but it kept its form but the content was constantly changing. So in that sense, um, Latvian, and La being Latvian is a very solidified identity. But then that's what I was also intrigued by is that you can naturalize into Latvian citizenship, you can profess your Latvian language. And I met quite a lot of Russians or Russian speaking people who were uh, preferring to speak to me in Latvian with the huge accent with a lot of Russian words in between, but they nevertheless wanted to stand out as, as Latvian. But then my other respondents would look at that and say, no, no, she's not a Latvian. She's, she's you know, uh, Ruski. She's, she's something to do with Russian. So, and that's what is really interesting is that you cannot become Latvian. You have to be born into being Latvian. And that's beyond ethnicity. And that's something I was always perplexed and I think I didn't push enough yet in my writing. But that idea is sort of, it's beyond ethnicity, right? It's, it's I mean, of course, being born and so on is, is quite primordial and, and genealogical in that sense. But it's, it's, it's almost like a ethos of things that you cannot learn. And the, the case in Kazakhstan is actually quite different. And that's what is happening right now with, and I did try, I think it's a, somewhere in the text where I say that there are a lot of um, so-called Slavs and they're quite different from um, Central Asians, um, even by the looks, but then you can be blonde, um, you know, Sabr, but your name is Alexander, for example, so Sasha, but you can be Kazakh speaking. And that's also becoming a normalcy in Kazakhstan. Or, or the people call you like, you know, our Kazakh Russian brother. And that's also part of the popular discourse right now that is again, emerging with this new generation of people that are using Q instead of K, um, which is for me, again, a transformative cultural uh, part. And again, Kazakh segment in itself is, is highly uh, fragmented. And I was again talking about it today with, with um, uh, Seltu Tumlo, is that it's not only about uh, tribal fragmentation that, that actually is in essence makes you that you are Kazakh because you have this uh, tribal identity. But then on the other hand, there's a lot of regionalism that is not as distinct, for example, as in other cases, like Tajikistan is quite regionally uh, uh, divided due to particular history, but also nevertheless, it's there. And I think even division into Nagaz and Shala, which is Nagaz is a real Kazakh, the one who's Kazakh speaking and so on. And Shala is the one who's urban, Russian speaking and so on. And sometimes Shala is also called asphalt Kazakh. So, you know, somebody who's born in the city and lost uh, sort of the, the traits. I wrote about it in one of my lens, um, books, the, the Nazarbayev generation, I, I wrote about Mankurts also, somebody who forgotten the uh, cultural and ethnic roots. But then, you know, even division within that is always happening in the field of Kazakhness. 
And uh, even within Nagas, I would go even further to say that Nagas itself is not yet solidified. So the real Kazakh, right? What does it mean to be a real Kazakh? You can be perfectly Kazakh speaking. You can have, uh, you know, you can come from the South and so on and so forth, but then something would be wrong with you. You're wearing jeans. And that's always contextual. There's not a set of uh, stable identifiers that can, you know, place you in a specific membership. That's why ethnicity and identity and national identity is like, is always in flux and contextual and, and very few people can actually have full control over it, especially when it happens in this everyday interaction. So I think Kazakh um, segment in general is super fragmented, even on linguistic base. Um, I just was following certain debates about how one word was written and people are debating whether it's a dialect or, you know, regional language somewhere in, in West Kazakhstan. So definitely fragmentation is there. And it's not a bad thing. It's just what, what happens. It's nature. Great. Uh, another set of question is related to the kind of the broader post-Soviet context and the relationship to Russia and how the relationship to Russia is in fact shaping both the regimes and their nation building strategy. So in fact, you have a kind of, you have a third party <laughs> actor into what is happening at home in each of these countries. So how do you articulate the role of Russia as a, a mirror, a counter mirror, and how it's kind of indirectly participate in the, the both the nation building and the regime kind of shaping? I think that that's the, yeah that that's a key a key question also in, in the discussion for all region for the world region. Yeah, I think yeah, Russia is a big elephant in the room, and uh, it's what what again Rebecca described as kin state, um, and I've been coming back to it in in the study I did on Crimea, which I didn't publish yet. But basically, I look into why and how in certain cases the specific. Uh, you know, protection of Russian speaking communities plays out in certain cases, it doesn't. And I know that um, Kazakhstan stands out in that sense because it is one of the biggest recipients of this community uh, in, in the whole post-Soviet space, it's not the biggest, well, comparable to Ukraine, of course, and, and that's a different story. But uh, a new Marlen wrote about it as well, sort of how and why Northern Kazakhstan does not follow the Crimean uh, scenario, for example, right? And for many researchers, it's still a puzzle. Um, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, part of this discussions yet, but, but nevertheless, for me, it's always interesting to see how and why uh, Russia um, as an actor, as a, as a policymaker, decides which community to protect. But then again, and, and I think I provided in chapter four in the book where, where I talk about the Russian speaking minority and I, I also have a problem with the idea of what is a Russian speaking minority, right? Because half of Kazakhstan then will be a Russian speaking uh, minority, including me. Uh, but um, and, and then, for example, there were very, um, you know, particularly they had a specific line towards the Baltic states, including Estonia, and they used a lot of international organizations, including OIC, to play out that discourse that, that uh, the rights of Russians there are infringed. They played out, um, you know, a very well-established uh, and still networked idea of giving citizenship to these people who still live in, in Latvia or reside in Estonia, but they have Russian passports. Uh, and I describe it as, as a call for dignity for them, right? Because they want to belong somewhere, these people, these non-citizens. But then on the other hand, um, the situation when OEC was criticizing Kazakhstan a lot more uh, for, for treating its minorities, like, you know, much worse, the United Democratic State and so on and so forth. Uh, Russia, on the other hand, supported Kazakhstan and said, no, no, it's actually good. And then that provides certain, like, you know, uh, discrepancies and differences in, in the approach and policy. And of course, in the 90s, it was very distinct because Latvia and Estonia were, um, you know, leaving very quickly the, the paradigm of the whole post-Soviet uh, space and they don't want to be post-Soviet, they don't want to be identified like that. They don't want to be in the purview of Russia and there's a lot of you know security discussion still in Lithuania. I hear a lot um, in terms of the foreign policy and 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 uh, threat. Uh, Russia is always the threat for the Baltic states. But then in Central Asia, it's it's a completely different story. Um, and I do you know I think Russia it plays a huge role um, even informally, even through um, and a lot of people wrote about that media influences and so on and so forth. But I was particularly interested in the treatment of of these. Um, communities and how and why it plays out in different spaces, uh, in different contexts. And they decide to annex and then in different contexts they don't decide to annex and they go on. So it's, it's quite an interesting um, study that, that I need to further develop and then come up with a more nuanced answer to that. Uh, another question that is kind of following your discussion on, on the identity ambiguities of those that we define as minority in both countries and the way they relate to the, the 
the titular uh, majority, a question about what, all, what about all these group of people who are Métis or Creole, those who are in the middle, right? Those who don't fit in the categories. Maybe these one are in fact a large majority or a large group that tend, you know, to be kind of understudied because we don't know exactly how to capture and they don't enter into this, this kind of broad division. So, so how would you frame that? I mean, you were mentioning Russians, I mean, Rus people that we would say are Russian who wants to speak <laughs> Latvian and are proud of being Latvian. I mean, all this kind of, all this flesh of everyday life that make people not fitting into the categories. How do you, would you address mm -hmm. that in, in the kind of the conceptual part of, of your mm -hmm. work? How do we do, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a fantastic book coming out by um, Adrian Lindgar on the mixed, mar mixed ethnic marriages in Soviet Union. I'm really looking forward to that. I heard uh, her present at different conferences and it's, it's very, very interesting. And she, I think she looks into the 1970s exactly with this policy of when Soviet uh, state, you could say, was actually experimenting with the idea of, you know, pushing the boundaries of this ethnic group that they sort of created um, and then, you know, trying to merge them or blend them together um, and, you know, sort of to, to um, diminish this, this ethnic border and then create essentially create the, the Soviet narod, the Soviet people. And that's something, I mean, I said to Tumlu, who's in the audience here, she, she has a paper first coming on the understanding of the Soviet identity and, and what it meant, especially in Kazakhstan, because I think we, we were quite a big part of that experiment. Um, I do look into creolization specifically and through that language of creolization and uh, if you want to put it yes post-colonial and decolonial perspective in my forthcoming study um, which is going to be about um, again it's the rethinking of looking at the state and I'm really you know I'm perplexed with the idea of the state but looking at the state from below and looking at the state and what it means to citizens or to people in the society and then looking at the state from all different varieties as a territory, as a nation, as a community um, and then in one of the chapters I actually look into the influence of Soviet nationalities policies and then how these people Creoles are responding to that because there are quite a lot of them and they came out in my interviews early on and they were actually saying, well, we're not Kazakh, we're not really Russian, we're a mixture of everything, uh, but we are here, so where do we belong? And we speak Russian, obviously, because that's the language that, that you know, becomes available. That's the lingua franca to people like us who don't have particular ethnic um, rooting. And I, and I have that interview actually in front of me where the woman is actually saying, well, I was born in Tashkent, my father's South Caucasus, I'm not Caucasian, I'm not Central Asian, I do speak Russian, where does it place me? Um, and there is actually a group of people in that chapter, I want to write about them, that is called Creole Club. Um, and they emerged in Almaty, uh, Ruzija Nurbekova and Maria Vilkovitsky, they are art practitioners and they're developing that idea further. And I think there's quite a bit of, that's why it's so fascinating to study these, these movements and these groups and activists, because they, you know, they think much, grander and they think much beyond these these categories and there's a big decolonial movement now in certain uh, artistic circles in Almaty that are actually also thinking along these lines and sort of if in the 90s it was all about trying to find your roots and authentic national past and belonging and where do you belong and a lot of the experimentation were with nom nomadic art nomadic perceptions and so on Sam Halton was part of uh, that and he was actually himself a Tatar from Russia um, and the now the new generation is actually looking beyond and they're looking to decolonial, actually, hopefully beyond this city, beyond this um, boundaries that, that uh, in fact, yes, the Soviet Union did had um, influenced quite a lot on construction of these boundaries. But then nevertheless, I think there were other things that played out in including nationalizing vision that played out in cementing them further. So I have big hopes for, for that project and um, I do try to conceptualize it there. Great. Uh, a question that is maybe more on the conceptual side. Uh, you are using the notion of nationalizing regime while Brubaker is speaking about nationalizing states. So just if you could clarify if you see a, see a difference in the concept between a regime and a state. And then also if you could be more explicit about the different nature of political regime in Latvia and Kazakhstan. I mean, if we see them in a kind of very schematic 
political way as one is a democratic one, the other is an autocratic one, then, then how the comparison works. And of course you may uh, have much more uh, nuanced way of looking at the, the nature of the political regime. So if you could look at, comment on these uh, two aspects. Yeah, and I'll start from the latter. I'll start from the regime. I'm trying to find the definition I used, but it's basically the ways, um, yeah, it's, it's, it is the formal and informal structures and nature of political power in the country, including the method of determining office holders and the relations between the office holders and the society at large. That's what for me is regime in general and nationalizing regime I define as the political uh, field, field of power, uh, that um, where the people or elites who are in this uh, field, right? They, they have their own positions, they have their own interests, and they constantly struggle for power. This is a very Bourdieuian idea, is that at the, at the heart of every relation, at the heart of specifically of every power relation, there's always a struggle. It's not a peaceful or a smooth, um, you know, action or process always about fighting. It's always about bringing your interests further and, and gaining the bigger position based on something that you are bringing to the table. And he talks about capitals. Here I'm talking about meaning making, which is also about capital. Those who have more access to say that our I'll make our nation grander, better, more historical, will change the constitution to make it the nation of Latvians and so on and so forth. That person or that coalition of that party gains more power within the, at least within the field, right? Um, and that's what for me is regime. Uh, Burbaker, um, he himself, and he, he has the paper um, that I'm rereading many, many times from 2011, where he's trying to revisit nationalizing states. And he says, it's not really a theory. It's a framework that can help to analyze certain things. But then in the end, and that's cr crucial for me as well, because we're both sociologists, he talks about the idea that he does not want to define the state or separate the state from the society because he wants to keep it the fuzzy line and this ambiguity to both. And then when I was writing about it today, because I, I do this um, conceptual paper, rethinking Brubaker now, um, and, and to me, I think, I think one of the criticisms would be is that he comes from a very European or Western perception of the state where, you know, it's a different, um, it's a different tradition, it's a different perception of the Westphalian framework, of course, that he's embedded in. And he himself, I think, is not quite reflexive of what he's uh, bringing to the table with the theorist. Uh, and what, what me coming from the region and being, you know, a scholar who is embedded in the ideas of an am the child of post which I try to really portray in the book through even self-ethnography and being reflexive on the fact that, you know, I'm doing fieldwork at home, uh, is that I am more um, cautious about the things. And that's why I'm so, um, you know, I'm fascinated with the idea of the state, but I don't view it from the same perspective. That's what Maria also said, is that it was given to us as a model. It was given as, as you know, um, go and run with it. But then how it was implemented, how it was built further on is, is a different story. And that's what we really, really need to focus our attention to from all sorts of perspectives, political science, political geography, uh, political sociology, you know, political ethnography and so on and so forth. Is what are the, the distinct playing outs of state building itself? And I don't, I don't view state as, with all its humongous institutionalization, the state being the idea that governs us in, in all sorts of ways, uh, the, the hidden orthodoxy of our lives, that's how Bourdieu defines it. You know, I don't view the state as this very clear cut actor in all of these things. I'm not an IR specialist, you know, to say that state is an actor. To me, the decision making within the state, within all these institutions, formal and informal, within all these practices, it's something else. That's why for me, it's so important to bring out this idea that decision making is done through the regime. And that's why this decision making is never again smooth, even in places like Kazakhstan. It's always a competition. It's always a struggle. Of course, there's somebody above, uh, above everybody else who can be the, you know, uh, taking over control of who decides and so on and so forth, being Nazarbayev himself for a very long period of time. But then nevertheless, uh, Nazarbayev is not the state, you know? And if we're looking at who nationalizes, it's the regime, it's not the state. That's what, what I really tried to put forward is sort of, you know, the model is great, but it's slightly outdated. It takes a lot of things for granted. It takes a lot of assumptions for granted as well. It's heavily based on Soviet uh, legacy, which was true in 1996 when he was first writing about and conceptualizing it. But we moved on, the whole field moved on, and we need to look you know, more critically at these things and how they work out nowadays. Um, why, why, why looking at Latvia and Kazakhstan because they're so different and so on and so forth? I think um, on the regime perspective, and again, going back to this idea is that it's about uh, form who governs and why, right? Um, you can you can look at any regimes, 
but what was important for me is that these two came out from the same experience and these two had and were homes uh, to the biggest Russian um, speaking minorities or whatever you want to call them, proportionally almost outnumbering the so-called total ethnicity. So in that sense, it provided a lot of interesting comparative grounds, um, despite the fact that one is, you know, both of them have elections, obviously, and uh, whether performed or real. Uh, but uh, and that's why in the book, I'm very, very careful. I'm giving my reader the, the conclusion, you know, you should decide which one is a democracy or non-democracy. I'm very careful with these concepts in terms of like, you know, not everything, again, is a clear cut as it seems. I know a lot of my answering answers right now seem like, you know, we need to rethink the whole post-Soviet nation building, but maybe we do because I simply, I struggled as a, as a student of nationalism, but I can't really work with what was given to me by all these big theories in the 90s. They no longer worked when I came to the field, unfortunately. So yes, it's time to rethink them. Great uh, comment, Diana, and I think you, you, your definition of what is at not state, but, but regime is really an excellent one. And it's all, you know, all this current field of like the ethnography of the state that is showing us so much how many actors you have in one state, right? And, and mm -hmm. that how much the, they are permeable to what we would define as the society. So I think that that was a key element. Last kind of broad question with multiple sub questions that were coming from the the audience was, what's about how would you define, and it's also a kind of big question, the, the arrival or the transformation of identity globally. So the fact that now you can have supranational identity. So for example, for Latvia, what role would Europe play, right? Maybe those that we see as ethnic Russian happy to be Latvian are in fact identifying not so much with Latvia, but with a kind of broad vision of what Europe can mean, what it would be for Central Asia, could Islam be also a kind of non-nation boundaries limited identity that are arriving? And what about the, the, the relationship to China that on the contrary can play the role of a counter model? So if you could very briefly address this kind of... <laughs> I know it's the kind of it, the, tough, <laughs> the tough final question in a few minutes. It's, it, it, it's always the question from political scientists, you know, like, but what about the, what about Eurasian economy? What about this? What about that? I think it's very complex. And um, I really liked one of the review that basically captured what I'm trying to say is that this is a messy process. This is not something that, that you know, we can encapsulate and say, this is it. And that's going to be it for the next 10 years. No, identity is constantly on the move. And that's what I like about the part of nationalizing is that it's constantly in flux and it can be contradictory to whatever we did, you know, three months ago. Uh, look at Kazakhstan, how many programs of national revival we had in the past seven years. And that can tell you a lot. Bro. And I'm still surprised people discuss what's Kazakh because everybody by now forgotten even what's Mangaliki and, and that's what came after it, right? And now people, I mean, that's another thing about, you know, what, what how Rohani Guru is remade into Kenguru and other things uh, in, in poetry, by the way. And I should say that it's it's uh, Anwar Dusimbin of the poet and it's fantastic uh, poetry that he produced, contemporary poetry. So um, in a way, like, you know, um, and I love this quote from Zygmunt Bauman when I was a master student. He said, um, um, in this complex globalized world, an identity, a certain identity, a single identity, has the survival rate of a snowball in hell. You know, and I, I, I'm quoting from my memory, but I think that's what he said. And uh, so to expect that certain identities would be stable and dominant and contingent to only like, you know, this particular moment is, of course, uh, a very false idea. Nevertheless, that's what I'm arguing that nationalizing regimes are trying to do. They're at least trying to, you know, encapsulate and dominate as much as they can while they realize that all of their attempts are always, you know, um, captured to be failed at some point, but they still reach certain people in terms of values and so on and so forth. So in a way, what I'm trying to get at is that, of course, supranational identities are there. A lot of Russians do consider themselves European, even in Central Asia. And that's another issue to colonial history to think about that as well, right? As they say, we are the European population. Um, but um, these identities, they, they exist in this complexity and, you know, contradiction sometimes to each other. A lot of Central Asians don't want to be Asians. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people in Kazakhstan want to be European as well, uh, not Eurasian. So there are all of these ideas there. Um, China is also coming with a, with a, a board, the one, one, one sort of the, the greater Silk Road idea and so on and so forth that has been embedded in a lot of national ideologies in, in Central Asia in different places. I, I once had a paper saying, 
who does Silk the Silk Road belong to? Because there's so many different national programs in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan claiming the Silk Road in, in Kyrgyzstan as well in terms of the UNESCO projects and so on and so forth. So in a way, all of these identities, they coexist at the same time and they're highly contextual and they're highly, you know, you can't really set one of them in place and say, this is the dominant one. But you can try to encapsulate and study how and why certain people try to set that meaning in place and dominate over it, at least dominate over its production, which is again, the, the, the possibility of surviving in hell, but they, they do manage to be successful certain, to a certain extent. And that's why they exist. That's why this logic continues to drive this political competition and outcome. Well, I think that was a great conclusion to show the nuances <laughs> of, of uh, uh, your approaches. And, and really, so Diana, congratulations again on, on this, this book you. being out. And I'm sure there will be several uh, forthcoming discussion around the book that will uh, uh, generate a lot of discussion for our field, both our regional field and our kind thank of theoretical you. field. So once again, congratulations. Thank you so much, Asel and Maya, for your great thank comments. You. Thank you to the whole audience for participating so, so lively. That's great. Everything will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel if you want to watch it again. And please stay with us next week. We will have another book launch. So that just to show how much our feed is, is developing. We will be discussing uh, uh, Maya, Peterson's, uh, latest, Maya Peterson's latest book, Pipe Dreams, Water and Empire in Central Asia, Arad Sea Basin. So once again, thank you, everybody. And, you and so stay safe. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye.